Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Park Advocate series on our uh, priority legislation. Um, it is really great to see everybody here. There's folks still joining. We're, we're dealing with a little glitch on the back end, which is why you can't use chat. Um, so the intent was to have um, you all be able to introduce yourselves in the chat and um, of course, you know, communicate with each other in the chat and then ask questions uh, through Q&A for panelists. Um, so if until the um, until we get the chat working, uh, why don't we hold off on the introductions just because otherwise Q&A will get too crazy. And um, if you have a question during the webinar for any of our panelists, um, please enter it in the Q&A and uh, we will um, and here's the th this handy dandy slide on how to access chat and Q&A right here. So again, if you have questions for panelists in the chat, um, I mean, in the please enter them in the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can um, and we'll follow up uh, with those that we're not able to um, get to at this in, in the webinar today. Um, so before uh, I introduce our speakers, um, I want to uh, go through the agenda for today's session. So we have, uh, we're going to spend about the first half an hour on um, a bunch of priority bills and key bills that we're advocating and watching this year. Uh, and then we're going to move to our uh, a panel discussion on our sponsored uh, legislation, which is AB 1150, and um, we've built in Q&A time in each of these sections um, for you to ask about legislation at those times. So we have a wonderful lineup of speakers um, for you today. So our, we're going to kick it off with Abigail Mile of Environment and Energy Consulting, um, and then our own Randy Wadera will moderate our panel on AB 1150. And uh, we're going to be joined by Keith Cellino, who is the principal consultant with the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. They are uh, actually the author of this bill. It's a little unusual, so he's going to tell us about that. And Sonia Diaz, who is with Outdoor Outreach. And Outdoor Outreach has been an incredible driving force behind this bill, which is an effort to make it easier for nonprofits to run programming at state parks and beaches. Um, and we're just super proud and happy to come on with Outdoor Outreach uh, as a co-sponsor of this bill. So Sonia is going to tell us that when we get there, she's going to tell us all about why uh, they've been working on this. So uh, we, I would like to now turn it over to Abigail Mile of Environment and Energy Consulting, and she's impressed many of you who've had an opportunity to talk with her, uh, with her knowledge of the legislative process. She specializes in land conservation and environmental equity and climate policy with Environmental and Energy Consulting and has been just a wonderful partner to California State Parks Foundation in helping us advance our policy and budget priorities for state parks. So Abigail, take it away. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, and, and glad to see so many people here excited to talk about uh, some really cool bills that are moving through the legislative process this year that the State Par Parks Foundation will be engaging on. So I'm going to go through some of the top priorities and just give a little bit of background about each of these bills and, and how they're going to benefit um, not only parks, but further some of the State Parks Foundation's goals uh, and, and their agenda for this year. And happy to answer any questions on specific bills uh, once we get through the list. So I'm going to kick it off with the category of climate resilience. Um, there's one bill that we're really prioritizing engaging on in this category this year, and that's SB 272 by Senator Laird. So this bill focuses on sea level rise preparation and adaptation for local agencies, local governments, um, and it would require local governments within the coastal zone up and down the state to develop and implement sea level rise adaptation plans uh, within the next 10 years. And so one of the main reasons this is needed statewide is, is keeping in mind 
a lot of local agencies and uh, you know towns up and up and down the coast just either don't have uh, the, the bandwidth to prioritize sea level rise adaptation or there are political barriers getting in the way of that really important planning uh, that will make sure our coasts are resilient. But this bill would would really prioritize that they they implement these and then would prioritize those towns with sea level rise adaptation plans for statewide sea level rise funding. So it seems like a uh, a bit of a technical bill, but it really is going to encourage uh, towns up and down the coast to to make sure we're preparing for the impacts of climate change and sea level rise that are already hitting our coast very hard, as we've seen, unfortunately, over the last couple of months uh, with the intense winter storms. So we'll be supporting this bill throughout the process. Moving on to equitable access, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this bill later in the webinar, but really want to highlight uh, a co-sponsored bill with Outdoor Outreach and the California State Parks Foundation this year. Uh, and this is the bill that Rachel mentioned is authored by the Committee on Water Parks and Wildlife in the Assembly. So this is a really exciting bill. I'm excited to talk about it and, and hear more about it from the partners later in the call. But it's really going to make partner organizations who focus on equitable access within state parks more, it's, it's going to make all of this more accessible. It's going to make running these programs more doable, more feasible, and less costly, both to the nonprofit partners and to uh, the people participating in these programs. And to do that, it'll be creating the authority for state parks to enter these unique agreements with the nonprofit partners hosting access programs uh, and, and let them, you know, get around some of the barriers that are, are currently existing in the state park system, like needing a lot of permits to host these programs or needing to pay a certain amount of fees that ultimately then are passed on to the program participants. Um, so being able to construct agreements between the department and organizations is going to make a world of difference and making sure these programs can continue to operate. I also want to highlight another equity bill, AB 618 by Assemblymember Bauer Cahan. So this bill, um, also a very cool one as far as park equity and access goes, but it takes a slightly different approach of addressing some of the, the barriers to getting camping and lodging reservations and, and access to the state parks that way. So this bill would it would do a couple of things. First, uh, it would make sure that we're incentivizing people to cancel reservations that they're not going to be using in state parks early. And I'm sure any of us who have gone to state parks and, and camped and lodged have experienced this. I know I have many times in the past uh, where you can't get a spot and then you realize once you get there, okay, all these spots are reserved and, and no one showed up for them. So what this bill would do um, is it would allow folks to get a refund if they cancel early. Uh, or at least get a, a credit to use at a later date. So we can make sure that all of our camping spots that we worked so hard to maintain and make sure are there are actually being used and, and accessible for everyone. Uh, this would also create a lottery system for some of the more competitive camping spots and, and park locations that are just really difficult to get a spot in. And, and that will make it more difficult for one. Um, for folks to, to use bots or other tools online to get reservations and, and beat others out of having a fair chance to access those spaces. So excited to see this one move through the process. And then finally in the equity realm, I wanna talk about AB 401 by assembly member Mathis. Um, this, I'm really excited about all these access bills. <laughs> this is another really cool bill. Uh, that would be expanding the fourth grade Adventure Pass program, which we're all such big fans of. So right now that program has been super successful and it allows access to fourth grade students across the state to 19 specific state parks. And it has a sunset date of um, 2024. Because it's been so successful, this bill would expand that to all state parks. Uh, so fourth graders everywhere in California can utilize those passes and would also lift the sunset provision. So it would make this more of a, a far reaching and long standing program. Uh, so also excited to see this one move forward. So moving on to 
the funding side of things. Um, and I know we had a separate discussion to talk about budget. We don't wanna to get too far into all the complicated funding discussions here, but I do wanna highlight um, two bills that are moving through the process, one in the assembly and one in the Senate concerning a natural potential natural resources bond um, that would then, if it, if it passes through this legislative process, could be placed on the ballot for statewide approval sometime in 2024. But both of these bills are being developed right now. The legislature is negotiating about what could go in them. And obviously we're advocating hard for parks to be prioritized in that language to make sure we can get funding for programs, funding for deferred maintenance, funding for infrastructure projects, um, and make sure we can support our parks, whatever may come from these two bills. And then park experiences. Uh, a couple a couple of bills we want to highlight here. One is SB 668 by Senator Dodd. So this bill would, if you recall, maybe about 10 years ago, there was a similar bill, uh, AB 42, that allowed operating agreements between state parks and our really valuable nonprofit operations partners um, that do a lot of the work in the parks, really improve the experience for visitors. And, um, you know, this has been really successful over the last 10 years. That agreement legislation expires in 2024. So Senator Dodd is stepping in and saying, hey, our nonprofit partners are just so valuable, can't do all of the things that we do at parks without them. Um, and this bill would be extending the ability for parks to enter into those operations agreements uh, for, you know, for good. So this is very exciting, excited to, to be involved in this legislation once more, like we were a couple of years ago or 10 years ago, and make sure that this is a longstanding uh, option for partnerships. And AB 411 by Assemblymember Bennett. So this, this bill is very closely in line with one of our priority bills from last year, uh, and that was AB 1789, also by Assemblymember Bennett. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight both of those. Uh, that bill did not pass last year. It was it was held in the Appropriations Committee. But this year, we're, we're trying again. It has really similar goals of providing long-term, sustainable, reliable funding for trails, construction, and uh, maintenance. So this, this bill I was actually just amended today, and we, we know a little bit more about what it's going to be doing. But it's going to provide really significant funding for uh, non-motorized trails statewide. It would create a program uh, at the Department of Parks and Recreation to fund the development and upkeep of those trails. So really excited about this and making sure we can maintain and expand the trail system statewide through this funding measure. And moving on to the next category that is honoring history and culture. Uh, also very excited about this bill by Assembly Member Ramos and we don't know a lot about what exactly the provisions are going to be, but uh, the intent of this bill and, and, and its plan is to make sure that we can partner with uh, tribes statewide in, in managing land, making sure that they're actively engaged uh, with, with maintaining and, and stewarding our resources and our lands. So this would provide authority to the Natural Resources Agency to enter into this co-governance type of agreement uh, with recognized tribes across the state. So excited to be supporting that and really excited to see that come to pass as we're expanding um, and, and chasing after this 30 by 30 goal to make sure there's a lot of, uh, of co-governance going on. Great. Thanks. So next I want to highlight uh, the bills that are designed to protect wildlife and nature. Uh, so I want to highlight AB 1041, another bill by Assemblymember Ramos. And this bill would prohibit the uprooting, the harvesting, uh, the unpermitted re you know, removal in all public lands of white sage. So excited to see that this is uh, protecting a native plant that is, you know, common across especially the state parks in the southern part of the state. Uh, and it's really just making sure we're maintaining these populations of native plants that uh, not only are good for our biodiversity, 
but also hold a really significant cultural meaning to a lot of the tribes in the area. And next we have SB 732 by Senator Menjivar, um, a new senator. And this, I mean, these last two bills, I'll say they're also just really fun. <laughs> so Assemblymember Menjavar is passing a bill to establish a, the official state bat, which we do not yet have. <laughs> so it would make the pallid bat the official bat of California. Um, talks a lot about how important these bats are for biodiversity, for managing pests and preventing wildfire, um, and, and also just for, you know, being an important part of the native California ecosystems. So excited to see this uh, pass and, and have an official state bat. And then finally, there's AB 261 by Assemblymember Kalra, uh, similar to the last one, but this would be establishing an official state mushroom. Um, another fun one. It would make the California golden chanterelle or Cantharellus californicus, the official state mushroom. Uh, it's, you know, all across the state. Very cool, very cool uh, fungi. And the bill talks a lot about all the benefits it has for uh, the California biodiversity and our ecosystems. So that is a quick overview of um, about 10 bills that we're tracking and prioritizing this year. Happy to talk more about the specifics of any of those, uh, if there are any questions. And um, we will, so I know that the chat is working because I'm seeing chats. So if you have a question, uh, please post in the chat um, any question that you have for Abigail on bills. And Abigail, before, um, while people are kind of gathering their thoughts, because I don't see any questions yet, um, I wonder, you know, if we can talk a little bit about um, where we see, because bills are getting rapidly amended now and going through the, pro the committee process. Um, the... Um, so I'm wondering, like, especially with AB 411, with the trails bill, like we do expect some of these bills to have some significant amendments. Do you want to talk about kind of that process? Yeah. So where we are right now, and I'm sure uh, Keith can, can jump in and fill you in on this as well, but bills are moving through the committee process in both houses. Uh, it's really crazy time. And that also means that bills are being amended left and right. So for example, AB 411 was something we were tracking for the last couple of weeks and we knew it would be expanding trails, but it was actually not until this morning that we actually saw it be amended to substantively outline how it plans to do that and, and the funding mechanism that it's gonna be utilizing. Um, so some of these bills, like one of the Ramos bills I mentioned, we just don't know exactly what it's going to be yet. Um, and even the office is still figuring that out, but we can know enough at this point, what the intention is and, you know, determine that we'd like to see it move forward. All right. Well, good. Now we've got some questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to hold the 11, AB 1150 questions, um, until we get to that part of the discussion. There's one about, uh, AB 1150 having, uh, motorized uh, recreational access within the park system. So I'll let you all, Sonia and Keith, think about that. <laughs> and we can answer that later. Um, the name of the bat is the pallid bat and it has its scientific name. I am, it's, I'm blanking on it right now, but I wanna tell everyone that um, all of the, these bills are going to be up on our website. Uh, they're actually there um, as we speak and um, our trusty webinar folks will post a link to that in the chat um, where all these bills are, and they'll have links to the full text that you can read as well. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about what you can do to help to pass these um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, <laughs> and Martin is asking about the point of the mushroom bill, is it to protect it from the public picking the mushrooms? You wanna talk about that, Abigail? Yeah, I will say there's nothing in the bill that would actually, it's not like the white sage bill where it would, you know, impose fines for picking them or, or harming the mushrooms. It Really all it's doing is establishing uh, the golden chanterelle as the state mushroom. So it's it's pretty symbolic, um, although I imagine that could come with some restrictions down the road. Great. And then I, uh, there's a question in the chat about, um, will you please remind us why fourth grade in particular is important for youth development? 
And I'm going to answer that, which is um, that fourth graders, there's two really good reasons for this. One is that fourth graders study uh, California history as part of the, stan the state standards in California public schools um, in the fourth grade. So it's a time when they're thinking about the state of California and its history. Um, and there's a lot of resources through the state park system, obviously, to learn about that. Uh, in addition, they're still young enough so that when they go to state parks, uh, when they use their pass to go visit state parks, they kind of have to bring their parents with them because they can't drive by themselves. Um, and so this is a way to get the whole family um, visiting parks um, through the connection to schools and the fourth grade. Um, so, uh, oh, this is an interesting one. Um, Oh, and just to answer Heidi's question, uh, the fourth grade access legislation, does it include offset funding for the support of this program? I imagine it has to have a fiscal impact if they're gonna make it, um, but I don't know that it includes funding. And I think that will be a big stumbling block for this bill. You wanna comment on that, Amb Abigail? No, I would agree. There's no funding outlined in the bill itself. So if they do want funding, they'll have to seek that through the state budget process. Um, but that, you know, with, with the budget condition as it is this year, that, that might be an issue. Yeah. And then this is a great question from Nancy. Um, how do sponsorship ideas get in the head of legislators? Do you want to address that, Abigail? Yeah, there are a lot of ways that can happen. I mean, sometimes legislators have these ideas and their passions from their careers before entering the legislature. Sometimes, and especially this year, uh, we're seeing a lot of brand new legislators after the 2022 election. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they they get involved in issues during their campaign process. And, you know, people ask them to, to sponsor things once they're here in office. Uh, but another main way uh, is basically my entire job <laughs> is to go talk to the legislators and explain to them, you know, this is what we need in either in your district or for a specific cause, uh, like for supporting state parks. And these are these are issues that we're experiencing on the ground. So uh, a lot of time lobbyists like myself or other organizations will be the liaison between constituents and the legislator uh, to make them aware of of the issues. Right. Um, oh, now it looks like the Q&A is working. So now, now it's like getting wild and crazy because there's questions in the chat and questions in the Q&A. So why don't we ask everybody from uh, this point forward, ask your questions in Q&A. Uh, but if you've already asked a question in chat, you don't have to re-ask it in Q&A. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing... Um, an op a, will there be a coalition opportunity for AB 1150? So we can talk about that when we get there. Um, and there is a comment about, um, oh, what is the long-term funding source planned for the trails bill? You want to talk about that, Abigail? Yeah. So I will say, because they just released this information today, I think they're still figuring that out. But I, I, I mean, the bill right now cites a new fund creation at the state treasury specifically for this recreational trails program that the bill would create. Um, and it looks like it would also be taking advantage of some of the leftover unexpended money from previous bonds like Prop 68. Um, so any money left over, it would then uh, you know, try and grab that, put it into a special fund for um, trail development and, and work from that. But I'll say that I, I do know part of the reason that it's unclear in this bill is because of the state budget condition this year and how we know funding is tight. So this bill and many other bills out there are having to do a lot of gymnastics and get very creative with funding sources to support these policy initiatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of questions about 411 and sort of what what will it, will it address specific trail uses, um, all types of trails, hiking, horseback, riding, bicycle, motorized, et cetera. Any insights we can give on that? Yeah, right now the bill is really specifically for non-motorized trails. Um, I think that's as specific as it gets at this point about the types of trails. So I imagine that would include any you know, natural surface trails, any equestrian trails, hiking trails, um, but it would not include like OHB trails or, you know, roads. Uh, I don't think that would, that would be covered by the current language. Uh, but I do imagine we're going to know a lot more as they continue to develop this in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and just a, a question about the pallid bat bill. I'm, I'm not sure 
Um, there's, there's somebody asking how this bat would protect biodiversity. And I don't know if that's a, a factor in, in this bill or not. I mean, I my understanding is this, that the bill is seeking to um, educate people about the benefits of bats and how they eat many, many, many times their weight in um, mosquitoes and other pests. Um, and so it's really about like, bats are our friends, but <laughs> maybe there is a biodiversity aspect as well, Abigail. Um, yeah, I will say it's it's not the bill itself doesn't have any substantive language on, on biodiversity, but it does include some fun facts, which I'm happy to share. Um, and that is that, you know, part of the how they protect biodiversity is uh, eating a lot of the pests that can kill forests. And then that helps prevent wildfire, which of course protects biodiversity. Um, and they also eat, you know, bark beetles and wood borers, which can kill plants and also protect biodiversity. So those are, those are my fun facts. That's all I have yeah. on that one. <laughs> yeah, we, as Abigail said in her introduction, uh, we just really think these, both the mushroom bill and the bat bill are fun. Um, we uh, supported, um, what did we, we supported another bill like this recently, I think, didn't we, Abigail? Or maybe I'm mixing up with the, um, uh, the Dudleya and the White Sage. Yeah, that was from okay. last year as well. That's what I'm that's what I'm mixing up. But yeah, I mean both of these bills are, you know, again connecting Californians with really important and beneficial and exciting aspects of the natural world, which is of course our mission in state parks. So um that's really why those kinds of bills are on our list. Um and are there fun facts about the mushrooms as well as for biodiversity and fire protection? <laughs> I wish I had more fun facts about the mushrooms, but unfortunately, I'm not the scientist. If anyone on here is and wants to chime in about fun mushroom facts. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, all right. I see another question, but we'll we'll hold and try to get to that um, to later because we're going to move to the next section now. Um, and uh, so, with that, I am going to introduce. Uh, our own Randy Wadera, Director of Philanthropy, and he is going to take it away with our panel. Take it away, Randy. All right. Thank you, Rachel, and, and uh, great work, Abigail. I'm so excited for this next bill and uh, the folks, Sonia and Keith, who we have here talking about it. I look forward to getting thousands of kids out into our state parks who now have a big barrier in terms of with the nonprofits and the communities that they're working with. So, um, and the champion of this work is uh, Sonia Diaz, who's the public policy manager at Outdoor Outreach. Uh, Outdoor Outreach is a San Diego based nonprofit organization that promotes positive youth development through meaningful engagement in the out of doors. And I know many of you on the call today know Outdoor Outreach there. Uh, work is just amazing. Um, and Sonia sort of leads Outdoor Outreach's policy and advocacy program, including outdoor voices, youth-centered civic engagement programs to help youth advance park access and environmental justice in communities. So she's creating the next generation of advocates for our environment. Um, it's so exciting. Uh, she served in the California state as a fellow, uh, as a legislative aide to state Senator Sheila Kuehl, where she staffed and analyzed bills covering environmental issues, health policy, and other areas. Um, you bring a lot of experience, Sonia. We're so thankful to have you here. Could you um, tell us a little bit more about AB 1150 before we uh, move on to Keith? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for that introduction, um, Randy. Uh, you know, this actually grew out of a an issue that we had locally, just trying to um, you know run our programs. And this has been a campaign for the last nine years that we've been working on. So I just wanted to to put that out there, and I can explain a little bit more about uh, what we intend this bill to do a little bit bit later. Great. Um, and so uh, maybe you can ex uh, explain what the bill will actually do and help uh, do, Sonia? Oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah, the many, so just to kind of give you some context, um, many of our youth come from communities that don't have access or the means to enjoy these spaces um, that they're experiencing. And many times, um, you know, they're experiencing these spaces with us for the very first time. And so we're an organization that provides that connection 
uh, that meaningful connection. And we provide all of the equipment, instruction, transportation to run 600 outings per year, from surfing at the beach to overnight camping in the mountains. Um, this bill, as I said before, arose first out of a local problem we had been struggling with for the past nine years, trying to work with California State Parks to allow us to run regular ongoing programs at their beach and park units. Um, for example, we currently have to take out a special event permit to take to take just 12 of our youth to enjoy a day at the beach, um, in addition to paying other fees like parking. Um, so for an organization like ourselves running the number of ongoing programs that we do at these same sites, it adds up. And so it just adds another layer of bureaucracy, another layer, additional barrier um, that we have to struggle with. Um, and these permitting systems were really set up for a one-time large-scale events and not for ongoing educational programs. So after talking to other organizations across the state, um, we soon realized that we weren't the only ones in this situation. Um, and so we approached state parks to see if there was a solution. Uh, unfortunately, they're not currently authorized to enter agreements um, or waive fees like this for nonprofits, uh, which was surprising to us. So uh, the best avenue for this was to create a bill that would allow, that would give them essentially the authority to do this. And that's a, that's what this bill does. So it allows state parks to create community access agreements to allow nonprofits this flexibility to run their ongoing educational outdoor recreational programs and provide these much needed visitor services that are so critical to creating a welcoming park, exper a park experience. So that's kind of the goal of this. And it's it's an issue about equity, really, because, you know, if you imagine if we didn't have this program it being turned away each time you visit a park and it really creates a negative experience, especially for someone who already struggles with the feeling of feeling unwelcome because they lack the financial means, resources, or don't live in a community um, with resources to experience these spaces on a regular basis. Thank you, Sonia. And I know um, working with our hundreds of partners throughout state parks that everybody's looking uh, for solutions like this that could really lower this barrier. So thank you so much for your leadership and outdoor outreach. And um, now let's like, let's kind of move to Sacramento and I get to introduce uh, Keith Cellino, who is the principal consultant to the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee at the California State Le Legislature. He's the principal consultant and he has worked with the legislature and since 2018, moving to Sacramento. Before that, he was at the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Marine Debris Program at New England Committee to complete his graduate fellowship at the NOAA Fisheries Office in the, of International Affairs. Uh, he holds a PhD and a master's in science and environmental sciences from the University of Massachusetts in Boston and a BA in environmental scientist from LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Um, Keith, I, we're so glad to have you here. And this is a committee bill, is it not? And, and why did the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee think that it would be important to unanimously support this bill? Yeah, th thank you, Randy. And, and thank you to California State Parks Foundation for, for having me uh, today. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, you know, the committee bills are unique. Um, each committee in the legislature can um, run up to five committee bills a year. Um, and it, it would be rare that a committee would actually run five. But committee bills are reserved for generally non-controversial changes to law or new programs uh, that might be created through a bill. And it requires that at least a majority of the committee membership sign on to be the author of the bill in order for it to move forward. In the case of AB 1150, uh, we have a 15-member committee, and we were able to get all 15 members to sign on as authors. So uh, it is wow. unanimous. It's bipartisan. Uh, it's really a, a great thing. And I think, simply put, it's because it's a, a great bill. It's a change that 
I think is it makes sense. And you know, based on Sonia's explanation, we we really want to remove those barriers to getting organizations uh, into the parks and bringing out particularly youth, but anyone uh, who has lacked access in the past into our state parks. And when Sonia approached me with this idea, it unfortunately wasn't the first time that I'd heard about the difficulties that organizations have in having these ongoing programming with state parks. And so, um, you know, you start to hear about things a few times and you realize, wow, this is really a problem. And, uh, you know, honestly, I couldn't think of a good solution. And Sonia came with a really amazing idea. And uh, so I personally was really excited to, to help get this through the legislature. And so I, I approached the chair of our committee, Assembly member Rebecca Bauer Cahan. Um, and I guess her home park would be like Mount Diablo State Park in the East Bay. And she understood immediately the need for something like this. And then we approached the rest of the committee with the idea. And again, all 15 members were enthusiastic and signed on um, pretty much immediately, which was really great. Yeah, that's um, great. I'm, I'm thinking of, um, I'm seeing some of the questions and um, some excitement around it. One of it was, um, and maybe Sonia and Abigail and Rachel to think about, is there gonna be an opportunity for a coalition to build around this bill and to build support of it? I, I don't know if there's some plans for that. Oh, absolutely. Um, last year when we tried running the bill um, before, we had um, at least over 35 organizations sign on in support of this. And that doesn't even include the countless number of individuals that also chimed in in support. And so the intent this year is to do the same again and create, and now with the help of um, the California State Parks Foundation, um, I, I know that that effort will exponentially increase and will get more people involved. And so, yeah, absolutely. And the more people behind this, more organizations, um, the better, I think. And it just shows that there's just a lot of support behind this. And I'll just chime in. Yeah, at the end of the webinar, I will be posting a link to a petition that individuals can fill out to in support of AB 1150 as well. Um, a, a question um, that we have here is, um, and again, maybe this is for Abigail, and I don't know if it was mentioned this, but will AB 1150 have any bearing on uh, motorized uh, recreational access in the state park system? Or I, mean, I can I can jump in. Uh, it will not. So the bill does not change the use of of any type of of access to parks. You know, we're not opening up any additional areas or closing any areas to motorized access. But if there is a an organization that uh, provides programming involving motorized access, uh, they too could access the, the new tool that this bill would create uh, and enter into an agreement with state parks to, to do those that type of programming. Great. Um, question, um, and those of us familiar with uh, state parks legislation and know that um, fees are an important part of what funds state parks. And so um, there's a question about, um, since so many of these fees that are charged for events, you know, go directly to support the parks, um, will there, how, we, how will they determine uh, if, if uh, a nonprofit is eligible for those fees? Is that built at all into the bill? And Keith or Abigail might have, yeah. Yeah, Sonia, I don't know if you have any thoughts, but feel free to, to jump in. Um, you know, again, the bill is targeted at nonprofit organizations or tribes that are offering programming, particularly to, to underserved park units and so, or park users, excuse me. And so, you know, I think as part of the entering into the agreement process with state parks is there would be uh, sort of, it would be incumbent on the organization to make the case for why this agreement is the right fit for them. But we also are deferring to state parks as well to make sure that you know, there may be situations or types of programming that do justify a special event permit. So again, we're adding a tool 
to the toolbox. And hopefully this is a great path to simplify, particularly for those ongoing types of programming that might be happening. Instead of having to get a permit every time, you set up one agreement that then covers your organization for a variety of, of different events or programs uh, for a, an extended period of time. Um, and we'll kind of see how that goes and we can always make tweaks uh, to the law in the future if needed. Thank you, Keith. Abigail, did you have? Yeah, I would just jump in and echo everything that, that Keith said. Uh, and also point out that I think part of the intentional structure of this legislation um, is that, you know, it's not waiving all fees for everyone. Like Keith mentioned, parks definitely would be able to, to screen and, you know, have a say in which agreements are entered into. Uh, and I would also say, I mean, the, the bill right now, it doesn't say every agreement will mean there are no fees associated. Um, I think it provides a lot of flexibility to the department to determine, you know, what they can work out to make sure that most people are getting benefit from these spaces, uh, while still, you know, we're, we're getting fees from groups who either are able to pay them or um, where it might make sense to, to still have those parameters. So, Yeah, thank you. Um, from the conversations that I've had and what I've seen and with partners and with state parks, I know that there's uh, frustrations on both sides. And the point is to make these parks accessible. And I think that, you know, this, um, I don't see these permits taking away from revenue. They're not, uh, it's really increasing. It's, it's growing the pie. It's making it more accessible to more folks as opposed to uh, swapping out. Um, all right, um, I, there's a lot of people are really interested on what are next steps for the bill? Is there a hearing date? Um, and how can they help get it passed? And maybe Keith, you could uh, uh, start that conversation and we can, and meanwhile, I'll be looking for more con uh, questions in the chat. Sure, so the, the bill is set for a hearing in the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee on March 28th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, our hearings typically start at 9 a.m. and can stretch for several hours. Uh, so I think a good way, you, you could tune in online and listen to that. And our website uh, was dropped into the chat and that will have a link the day of the hearing in order to actually tune in and listen in. Um, I think the uh, petition that Rachel mentioned that will uh, be linked later is a great way for you as an individual to register your support. And I think um, we'll be able to include that uh, in information that goes to the elected officials when they are making their decisions um, about this bill. And you know, again, we're hopeful that this is uh, hopefully a straightforward bill in the legislature this year. The first hearing is March 28th, and then there's other committee processes and votes that it needs to go through but we've got 15 members already signed on as authors. So I'm hoping that means it's smooth sailing through the process, uh, but certainly California State Parks Foundation will reach out if we need an extra boost at any point in that process. <laughs> um, one of the questions that I'm seeing, and this is a little bit of, again, insider for those of you who um, in, in our, we have all kinds of partners with state parks. And one of the questions was, uh, how would these agreements uh, differ from cooperating association agreements? Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe Rachel, if you want to talk a little bit about sort of the cooperating association agreements. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we have a complete answer for how they differ, um, but it, it, it allows the state parks to work with organizations beyond the cooperating associations, I'm understanding. Um, is that correct? That's my understanding. I don't know, Keith or Sonia, if you want to add in there. And my my understanding is this is a new kind of agreement that state parks would would have. So, um, you know, those of you, well, those of you who just are visitors to state parks are probably not familiar with cooperating agreements, but um, those of us who do work in state parks are. And really, these are agreements that state parks enters into with typically a nonprofit um, to do a particular function at the park. Um, and many of our co-ops are uh, actually re representatives of many of our co-ops are even here today, um, but they'll you know have an agreement to do maybe it's interpretation or run the gift store, or the kiosk or you know some camp host program, that kind of thing. So 
some specific function in state parks, whereas this would be an agreement with organizations that aren't necessarily running uh, programming or doing anything in the park, but are bringing folks to experience the park. I didn't know if anyone else had any thoughts. It's been really exciting over the last few years to see the partnerships office grow. And um, again, with the AB42, we have our park operators um, that are doing great work. And so this is just a, another, uh, I think, tool in the, in the toolkit for state parks to do, to work with community groups and to work and to build access and to build support around parks. Um, so it's one of the reasons that, that excites me. Um, any other questions? that I see. I see one about the funding in the bill. And I think we should talk a little bit about the fiscal what kind of where because it's quite minimal fiscal impact on state parks. So let's talk about that for a minute. Great. Who can help me out with that? Uh, I'm happy to jump in. So yeah, about funding in AB 1150, it does not include any funding. And I would say that's that's on purpose. Uh, really, it's just creating the authority for the department to enter into these agreements. So it's, when you look at it, kind of a technical bill. But as I mentioned with some of the bills earlier in the list, um, we're, we're in a tight budget year as a state. So a lot of bills with uh, a lot of funding tied to them. Uh, you know, it's it's nice and it's exciting to see them, but then uh, they're going to be stopped throughout the process. A lot of them will not make it uh, to the governor's desk and be signed when they have a lot of funding tied to them. So one of, you know, part of the beauty of AB 1150 is that it has an ex extremely low fiscal, and I'm sure Keith can provide more detail on like what that looks like exactly. Uh, but that means that it, it definitely has a stronger chance of getting through the process. Um, I'd also say, uh, part of the funding that could support these are, are other efforts in the legislature, like funding other state parks programs through the budget, like an outdoor equity grant program um, and, and other similar programs. So it's kind of a, a tandem effort there. Keith, I don't know if you have anything to add. Tonya, did you want to, I see you came off mute, so I'll defer to you. Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, that this has been a, a many years process working with um, California State Parks. And I think that, you know, they've been very helpful pro providing technical assistance on the language of this bill, uh, which is unusual. And I and I am really grateful for that. And I want to point that out um, and that they've been working with us, even though they can't take an official position on it, they have been working on us with, you know, crafting that language and making sure that they have the available resources um, to carry out this program. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, and I'll just add a quick comment about the potential cost to state parks. And so that's what gets considered in the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee after the committee that I work for. And uh, last year's version of this bill, it was like $150,000 or $200,000, which to be honest, I know that sounds like a lot of money, uh, is one of the lower fiscal impacts that bills can have other than none, uh, which we know to implement something like this, you need a staff person at state parks that is going to be looking at the agreements and working on the paperwork with the organizations that want to do that. And that does cost money because it's a person and they need to get paid and have benefits and all of those things. And so, you know, I think the majority of the cost is likely the staffing, uh, but we don't anticipate it's a big workload for state parks because most of these organizations may be applying for special event permits. So maybe we alleviate some burden in that set, that side of the office and um, that person or those people can now help work on forming these agreements. And again, it's like that one time you set the agreement and it lasts for a few years. So hopefully in the end, there's a cost savings because we're not constantly coming back to state parks uh, to set up new special event permits. And the time that it takes for everyone uh, to to look at all that and get the paperwork done. Mm -hmm. Randy, I don't know if you wanted to get to that question from Martin, if you saw that, but while you're looking at it, I just, I, I'm noticing some comments and questions about um, AB 42 operators, which are 
actually nonprofits who who manage parks in a much more global way than co-ops do. And thank you, George, by the way, for posting the links to the the link to the recent partnership study. Um, partners provide an incredible amount of support for state parks and uh, state parks could not run really without them. So uh, it's good to to always remember that. But I I think the way to think about AB 1150 and push back Keith or Sonia, if you think this is you have a different way you would say it, but it's it's just a like what we've been saying is it's a tool in the toolbox. So it's not so much that it requires the state parks or AB 42 operators for that matter to enter into these agreements, but it allows the authority for those agreements where they make sense and where they're needed. So I, I don't know that it's that it's necessarily that it's irrelevant to, to co-managers or to AB 42 nonprofit operators. But you know, if if there were a situation where this authority would be helpful, then that's great. And if it's not helpful because you already do it, then it's moot. Um, I don't know if you would add anything to that, Sonia or Keith. I think this could really help like smaller organizations um, who don't have access to even the means to apply to be an operator, you know, and go through that whole process. Um, and so it really opens up the field, I think, for you know, many different types of organizations to be able to run. And we're talking about educational programs and visitor services as that. As that encompassing, all encompassing when we talk about visitor services. And, and so um, that, that's kind of what this bill is trying to do. Um, I don't know, Keith, if, I, if you can clarify, maybe if, if you need to. Um, between uh, sure. No, I, you know, I think we envision just having a tool in the toolbox and having one kind of standard way to do things for you know, a lot of our state parks are not run uh, by nonprofit operators. And so, you know, if this is not the best tool for our nonprofit operators, uh, or if you would like to access this tool and you don't think that the language of the bill currently allows you to do that, please send that feedback my way because, you know, this is not a finished product uh, in any way. We can continue tweaking and improving it over the course of the year. Um, and you know, really want to work with you to make sure that it's um, it's good for your purposes, or if we're somehow not good for your purposes, please let me know. I think about it as like, yeah, the cost, but what are the benefits? I mean, if you think about all, you know, and this is really true, we can see it because we work with so many groups that this is a barrier. And just think about all the kids for the first time who'll get to go to the beach and experience the tide pool or go see the Monarch Grove that because they have a community group that can bring them, whereas opposed to getting the permit and paying the fees have been a block. I mean, just think of that that benefit. I mean, we've many of you who are on the webinar today over the years have seen when we can pull together a really good solid piece of legislation like that, how it really opens up so many opportunities. Um, for partners and for state parks, because um, this is something that I know a lot of the state parks folks that are looking for these tools so that they can have these um, relationships and they can support these relationships. All right, I see we're getting to time. I don't know if there's any last urgent things, Rachel, that you can think of or Abigail, Keith or Sonia that you want to add before we um, tell people how we're going to do this. How are we going to make this happen? <laughs> well, I do see one more question about whether uh, what type of organizations or what kind of events will qualify. Uh, and I don't know if there's that specificity in the language of the bill. Activities wise, it's pretty broad. I think there's um, you know, there's a definition of, as Sonia mentioned, visitor services. So I encourage you to take a look at it, but it's open-ended. Um, and then organizations, it's uh, nonprofits that are uh, public, nonprofit public benefit corporations in California parlance, and then um, tribes as well, California Native American tribes. Great. Well, I'm gonna, um, I think, close off now Q&A and I wanna, really thank our speakers, Abigail Mayo, Keith Cholino, 
Sonia Diaz, our own Randy Wadera, and Ashley and David, who are running things behind the scenes. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, and I wanted to just highlight that uh, more information on these bills is on our website at calparks.org legislative agenda. Um, and you can use the QR code on your screen to access that page. Um, we also are doing Park Advocacy Day, which we do every year. It will be May 16th in Sacramento. So please, if you haven't already, uh, consider signing up for to be an advocate and help us get these bills passed. Um, and uh, finally, um, let's keep the conversation going on social media. You can see our um, handles there for Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then finally, um, help us keep our programs informative and beneficial by filling out our survey. It's very quick. Um, but we really do value the feedback and uh, we put it to use. Um, so please uh, fill out the survey and you'll get an email as well after this um, after this event to with a link to it, but you can use the QR on your screen. Um, so with that, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and much more to come. The legislative cycle is just getting started for this session. So monitor our emails and our social, and please consider coming to Park Advocacy Day. Park Advocacy Day. And everybody, have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> everyone, thank you. Bye-bye.